Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda begin this story you were a great scholar who had traveled throughout the whole country and challenged people to scholarly debates based on scripture logic and he was undefeated you see, in those days in South India, the most popular of all sports, believe it or not, was not cricket, <laughs> like it is today in India, or baseball, or football, or basketball, or soccer. The most famous, of, the most popular of all sports was scholarly debates. You can imagine what kind of culture that was. And this person was Digvijay. That means everywhere he went, he was conquering all opposition. But as great as he was, even greater was his ahankar, or his ego. He earned so much wealth and so much fame that he would go from place to place on a decorated palaquin, being carried by so many people. And he would have processions with elephants and horses and dancing people and marching bands and Brahmins chanting verses. And they would all be proclaiming the Digvijay Pandit, the greatest scholar on earth, has come. And he wants to challenge anyone. So most people would run away when he'd come because they'd be exposed. And he was not inclined toward respecting anyone. His inclination was conquering everyone. So he came to Sri Rangam. 
which today, how many of you have been to Sri Rangam? Please raise your hand. It is the largest temple in all of India. It's really beautiful. It's very ancient. And as he was coming through, he was proclaiming that I have come to challenge anyone and everyone to come before me and ask me any question. There is no question in the entire creation that I cannot answer. Ask me any question. And a little boy, five years old, his name was Parasara, he ran up to the scholar and said, I have a question for you. <laughs> the scholar was a very elderly man. He said, who are you, a child? Away from me. He said, no, no, I have a question for you. I challenge you to a debate. He looked at him in disdain. All right, child, what is your question? The little boy reached down and filled his palm with sand. And he said, oh, great knower of everything who can answer any question, please tell me how many grains of sand are in my hand. <laughs> he was speechless. It was the first question in his life he couldn't answer. <laughs> he didn't know what to say. And a crowd of people came around and was looking, what are you going to say? What are you, if you don't say it, you're, you're defeated. <laughs> and as he was quiet, the little boy continued. He said, a great personality is like a tree that has many fruits. A tree that is laden with such fruits always bends low by the weight of those fruits. But a tree without fruits is standing very straight. Similarly, a person who has good character on the basis of the fruits of their qualities, they are very humble to respect others. But with all your scholarship and all your great learning, if you cannot respect other people, if you have no humility, if you have no devotion, then you are as worthless as this handful of sand. And then he threw the sand down. When wisdom is spoken by a small child, it has a very special effect. Because they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> it pierced that man's heart so deeply that he came off his palaquin and bowed at the feet of that little boy and said, I'm going to give up all of my ego. I want to become your disciple and serve you. Now, the great Acharya, or spiritual leader, of the whole of South India at that time was Ramanuja Acharya. And before he departed from this world, he appointed Parasara as his successor. Parasara had many, many followers. I would like to share with you a story about one such follower. This person approached Parasara Bhattar, and asked, can you tell me what are the most important qualities of a, of a virtuous person who is close to God? Parasara said, that is a very deep question, which is foundational to all one's spiritual advancement, to live by good character. He said, but I'm not qualified to answer that question because I don't have such character. I advise you to go to Tirupati. And there, high in a mountain, is a devotee named Ananta, specifically Anantacharya. 
He said, ask him. He will answer your question. Now today, you would just probably chat with him by email. <laughs> or look up his Facebook or something like that. <laughs> but in those days, there wasn't things like that. If you wanted to talk to someone, you had to go there. And there were no planes or trains or buses or cars. You had to walk. So this person, he walked 400 miles by foot, alone. And it wasn't just a walk. In those days, it was almost all dense jungle. Tigers, snakes, wild elephants. Very dangerous. But he walked all that 400 miles by foot, and then he had to climb seven mountains and cross over them until he finally came to the topmost of the mountains in the range. <clears throat> it's very high. And he found Ananta. And with folded palms, he said, I have come all the way from Sri Rangam because my Guru Dev, Parasara, has asked me to present question to you. Just one question. And Nanda said, well, please first take prasad, take lunch, and then I'll, let me give you a room where you can stay and take your bath. And after all of that, he came back and asked, he said, can I ask you the question? So what is the question? So what are the most essential qualities of one who wants to become close to God? He said, let me think about it and I'll answer you later. In the meanwhile, you can do nice service, seva. So he began to do gardening and washing pots and helping with cooking and doing all very menial services for a week, two weeks, a month, two months. Ananta did not speak a word to him. He kept just serving and serving and waiting patiently Maybe in his heart he was impatient. But he just kept doing his service to, service to God and service to other living beings, service to other people. He was just serving, serving, serving. Six months passed. And still, Ananta did not speak a word to him. One day, there was a big festival. And even that place was very, very isolated in a jungle. Thousands of people came for this festival. And Ananta had a big feast of spiritual food, prasadam, prepared for everyone. And this person, he was one of the servers. He served everyone. Then he sat down to eat. And Ananta came up to him and said, there's another batch of people, serve them first, then you can eat. So he served everyone else. Then he sat down to eat. Ananta said, there's another batch of people who have just come, serve that, then you eat. He served all of them. There's still another batch. And now all the people who were serving, serve all of them. By this time it was night. And everyone was gone. Everyone had enjoyed nice prasadam, food. And the only two people left were Ananta and this devotee. He still hadn't eaten. Then finally, Ananta came up to him and said, What is your question? <laughs> He 
He said, my question to you was six months ago. <laughs> what are the essential qualities of one who is close to God and one who hopes to be close? Ananda looked at him very gravely. He said, one who is close to God, a virtuous man or woman, is like salt, is like a chicken, is like a crane, and is like you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and he walked away. <laughs> you can imagine this man. He walked 400 miles. <laughs> he worked for six months. And that was the answer. He really couldn't understand anything. Salt? Who's like salt? <laughs> a chicken? What's so great about a chicken? A crane? And me? So bewildered, he realized he got his answer. There was nothing else to be said. So he walked all the way down all those seven huge mountains. Then he went crossing over rivers and going through forests 400 miles back to Sri Rangam. There he met Parasara, his Gurudev. Parasara was very cheerful to see him. Oh, you have come back. Very nice. Did you ask your question? Please tell me what was the answer. He looked and he said, I don't understand. Well, what was it? What was it? He said, one who is close to God is like salt. And Parasara was, oh, wonderful. <laughs> Did he say anything else? He said, it's like a chicken. Fantastic. <laughs> What else is like a crane and like me? And Parasara clapped his hands and said, wonderful, what a beautiful answer, so comprehensive and precise. <laughs> and this man was just standing there in a daze, like, I don't understand anything. And Parasara said, should I explain? Said, Please. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a month to get there each way. It's been eight months. <laughs> Parasara, said, Parasara said, please listen carefully. What are the qualities of salt? If you put salt in a preparation, if there's too much, it is unpalatable. If it's too little, it could be tasteless. Salt has to be very carefully balanced. Similarly, a true devotee is balanced. They do not take extremes. They're not superstitious or sentimentalists. At the same time, they're not just dry philosophers. They're not fundamentalists, nor are they lukewarm about their spiritual lives. They're very well balanced. In the Bhagavad Gita, it tells those who are on this path they are regulated. <clears throat> They're balanced. They don't eat too much or eat too little. They do not sleep too much or sleep too little. In their recreational activities, it's very balanced. They have time for their spiritual lives. They have time for their domestic lives. They have time for their, for their occupational responsibilities. All of their responsibilities are very carefully balanced. They don't Neglect anything that is important. This is a great secret. Balance and harmony in one's life. 
Yesterday, Ravindra Swaroop Prabhu was talking about the modes of nature. Wonderful, wonderful lecture. And one thing I was thinking is there was that question about um, creation and the mode of passion. Now, everything is categorized according to these three modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance within this creation. <clears throat> but how we perform our work, On a particular level, what's really important is what is our intention. Two people could be working just as hard doing the same thing. One could be in the mode of ignorance, one could be in the mode of passion, and one could be in the mode of goodness, and they're doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same way. If we're working with the desire to harm someone through our work, to inflict pain upon someone without care. That is the work of the mode of ignorance. If we're doing the same work with fruitive mentality, with a craving for the results of our work, with selfish ambitions, that is in the mode of passion. And if we're working with detachment, not in a selfish way, with the real concern for the welfare of other living beings. That work, even if it's really hard, that's in the mode of goodness. And when we work, the same thing, if it's done in a spirit of love and devotion to the Supreme, that is work beyond the modes of nature, Bhagavad Gita says. It is divine. So, so much is dependent on our intention. So, like salt, a devotee is very much balanced in one's life. Another quality of salt is it does so much for a particular food preparation, but always remains in the background. Just like tonight, because I'm saying this, you might become more aware for the first time in your life. <clears throat> but how many times do you eat food and say to the cook, this salt was fantastic? <laughs> you ever heard that? Yogi Purush? <laughs> Prema Devi, you've been around a long time. Have you ever heard? Such wonderful salt in this vegetable ah. preparation. Oh, people will say, nice vegetables, nice fruits, wonderful grains, wonderful spices, the way it's cooked is so good. But spice is giving it so much flavor, so much substance, so much of the experience. But it gives credit to everything else. So similarly, a devotee is willing to do everything, everything good for the welfare of others, but never wants to take credit for him or herself. Rather wants to give credit to others, gives credit to God, gives credit to all those who have helped her or him, gives credit to others. In other words, the quality of one close to God is humility like the salt. Another thing about salt is it loses its identity in a preparation. It just melts right into it. Yes? So similarly, devotee's heart merges in complete absorption in, 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 with loving intentions in whatever she or he does. This devotee says, well, what about a chicken? <laughs> How many of you have ever been compared to a chicken? <laughs> Would you consider that a compliment? Someone said, you're a chicken. 
Well, in devotee circles, that's one of the greatest honors. <laughs> if you understand the qualities of a chicken that's a, being explained here. <clears throat> Parasara said the nature of a chicken is... <clears throat> should I continue? Thank you, thank you. If a chicken goes to a waste bin, there is so much garbage all over the place. And the chicken will very, very carefully inspect everything and look for a nourishing seed. And will find that seed and eat it. And then scramble through the garbage and look for another seed and eat it. He's looking for the essence, even in a filthy place. So a dev devotee of the Lord is, in Sanskrit, Sara Grahi. Sara means the essence. <clears throat> and Grahi means one who is seeking the essence. In every situation of life, we should be seeking the essence. And what is that essence? Everyone has good qualities, and everyone has bad qualities. A devotee looks for the good in others and is not so concerned with the bad in others. Because it is a law of nature that we become what we associate with. What we attach ourselves to very much influences our own consciousness. When we look for the essence, for the good in others, we become enriched by their good qualities. When we look for the faults in others, we become degraded by those faults. Just like, just across the block in 26 Second Avenue, that was the first temple of the Hare Krishna movement. Just little storefront, smaller than this. And Srila Prabhupada was there. He came all the way from Vrindavan with this wonderful message. And the people that were coming to him, by spiritual standards, they really had a lot of faults. But he was always looking for the essence. If they even had one particle one particle of inclination for spiritual life, he would just see that spark. Even if it was f surrounded by massive darkness, he would see that spark, focus on it, encourage it, appreciate it, and fan it, and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. If parents are always criticizing their children, or if a husband's always criticizing a wife, or a wife always criticizing a husband, what you do by doing that is you really bring out the bad in them. You may have to point it out sometimes for their welfare. But when we see the good, and we appreciate it, and encourage it, it fans it. It brings out the good in them, and it also brings out the good in us. So like a chicken, we should be interested in seeking the good in others. And similarly, situations that come upon us, whether it is Success or failure, happiness or distress, honor or dishonor, pleasure or pain, health or disease, whatever it may be, we should be looking for the essence. The essence is the opportunity to grow in that situation. This is the symptom of a great person is always looking for that opportunity to, to, con to make a deeper connection to God and to grow 
materially, emotionally, and spiritually, in whatever situation that comes upon us, however inconceivable. The world is a mirror of our own consciousness. Like that example, if you have a glass, you can either rejoice that it's half full, or you can lament that it's half empty. It's a matter of our perception. So in whatever situation, where is the opportunity? It may be a visible or hidden opportunity, but I'm going to look for that opportunity to spiritually grow. And even in the most difficult circumstances, we can do that. Satyananda Swami often tells that story of the concentration camp in Germany. You have all heard that story? Please raise your hand. Should I tell? Well, he, his father knew a man who was a guard in a concentration camp. He was in the SS, the Nazi regime. And they would take people, mainly Jewish people, gypsy people, or people who just didn't fit into Hitler's conception of society. And they'd work them. And at a certain time, they would corral these people, starving them into this gas chamber where they would kill them, exterminate. But while one batch of people were in the back gas chambers, and afterward they had to bring all the bodies and put them into uh, furnaces to burn them, or bury, whatever, the others were in like a holding tank, a room, like the waiting room. And this guard, every now and then, he saw something that really aroused his curiosity. He saw butterflies drawn on the walls. And every now and then, he'd see another butterfly driven on the wall. So he asked some of the Jewish people who were about to be murdered, what is this butterfly? He said, I don't know. I didn't draw it. Sometime later, what are these butterflies? I don't know. Weeks went by. Nobody would answer his question. One day he asked an old man who was about to die, what are these butterflies written on the walls? He said, I know, I drew one. I just drew one. What does it mean? He said, a worm is living in the dirt, caterpillar, living in the dirt. Any moment somebody could step on it, any moment a bird can come and eat it, an animal can eat it, Huh. Very, very difficult life. And then after living in the dirt, it's put in a cocoon, which is like a prison. So similarly, you people have been treating us like dirt. We're living in this concentration camp, nothing to eat, being beaten, being whipped, being abused like dirt. And this prison you've kept us in, in the both emotionally and physically, it's like a prison house, like a cocoon. But through the process, the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly, to fly from flower to flower, freely, and drink nectar, drink nectar. So similarly, when you put us in that gas chamber, because I have faith in God, because I am surrendering to the Lord, 
I know for sure that this cocoon, by your arrangement, you are going to free me. And I am going to fly free in a liberated state like a butterfly and drink the nectar, drink the nectar of God's love. But as for all of you, you will have to suffer for all the atrocities you are inflicting on others. That is a very extreme graphic example of someone who is seeing a positive opportunity in the most negative situation. Sometimes things are beyond your control, but still, you can grow if you want. That's your free will to grow in wisdom, to grow in experience, and to grow in devotion. That guard, when he heard that, became so emotional because he was trained through propaganda and brainwashing to think that these people were subhumans. They were less than animals. They were despicable and they had to be cleansed from the earth for the welfare of humanity. But when he heard this wisdom, he realized this man, these people, they are very deep. They're very wise. They're very spiritual. I thought they were the animals. We are the animals. That man had a transformation. And he deeply regretted what he was doing. So like a chicken, look for the essence in every situation of how I can improve, how I can access higher powers, and you will find it. In the Bible, Lord Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will open. That's a state of consciousness. If we seek grace, we receive grace. Also, seeking the essence has to do with our own religion. In the name of God, in today's world, and historically, it's always been like this. Hatred, bigotry, exploitation, violence, even war in the name of God and religion. Terrorism. Destroying the lives of innocent people in the name of God. Why? And on a more moderate level, even just common people, they're suspicious, fearful, or hateful of somebody who believes something different than them. And we see this common in every religion, in the Hindus, and the Buddhists, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Muslims, and the Jains, and the Parsis, and every other religion in every other society, in every other situation, people become very much attached to the externals, the rituals, the language, the particular explanations within their particular books. And if there's a different explanation or a different name or a different language or a different way, it must be bad. It cannot be right. My teacher told me 5 plus 5 equals 10. And you say that 8 plus 2 equals 10? <laughs> you are misleading people. You are demoniac. You must be destroyed. It's as simple as that. Paritranaya sadunam vinashaya chuduskritam dharma samstapanarathaya sambhavami juge juge. Krishna tells in Gita, I descend again and again to give people the opportunity to know me, to love me, to establish true principles of religion.
when we only see the externals and we do not understand the essence of what it's for, why we're doing it, then we can fall into these traps. But a devotee like a chicken is looking for the essence in their religion. The essence of how to love God, how to be an instrument of compassion in every aspect of our life. Where we are harmed, we look for the essence of how can I forgive. Where there's temptation, we look for the, temp for the, for the, for the essence of taking shelter of a higher principle to overcome that temptation. And we learn to love God in every, level, in every living being's heart and appreciate different people from different faiths in how they're loving God or their heart, how they're trying to love God. The man asked Parasara, what about a crane? He said, oh, a crane? Just look at that crane. He's standing on one leg and he's just looking down into the, into the stream or into the lake. And all the little fish that pass, he just patiently lets them pass. Absorbed, concentrated in his focus. And as soon as a big fish comes, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Immediately eats the big fish. Doesn't concern with the little fish. Now, I'm not promoting eating fish. <laughs> but we have the lesson behind this is... Should I tell? The lesson behind this is that we are not concerned with petty things. We are looking for, we are focusing on what is really important in our life. The tendency of everyone in this world is we get so distracted and disturbed by petty, stupid, unimportant things, and the mind inflates it to look very important. Yes? And we become so preoccupied. I remember when I was 29 years old. I was told I was going to die in six months by a doctor. How many of you people have been told you're going to die within six months? When you, give, when you get that message, suddenly things that once seemed very important don't seem important at all anymore. You really focus on what is important. Somehow or other, I'm still here. <laughs> I drank water and ate raw foods for a while, and I got better. But <clears throat> that's a different story. Like the crane, we should be looking for the pot. We, sh we should be seeking what's really important. When there's a great personality, who can inspire us in our devotion, we should be very eager, eager to find that person and to grow and to really put our focus on what is big and important in our lives. Satato Brahma Jigyasa, the rare special blessing of human life is we have the chance to know God, to love God, and to awaken the unlimited ecstatic nature of the soul, which is beyond time. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sajja Kabunoi Sravanadi Sudhichiti Koriye Yudoi Love of God is within the heart of every living being. It simply has to be awakened. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago.
Gora Chandra Bhove. The Lord comes to this world, sends his representatives to teach us this lesson. Wake up, wake up. You are sleeping in the lap of illusion. Take the name of the Lord, wake up and understand who you really are and taste the nectar that is within your own heart. That is what is all important. And we should orchestrate our life in such a way that, we, that we're pursuing the essence. Well, what about me? Why is a great devotee like me? <laughs> and Farasara said, oh, he is like you, or she is like you. Because you were so eager to get spiritual knowledge, to improve yourself, that you walked through jungles for 400 miles, and then you climbed mountain ranges. Then you patiently did service, serving others, serving God for six months, waiting for the answer. So similarly, if we want to know God, we have to have enthusiasm, but we also have to be patient, like you. And you fed everyone else before eating yourself. You had a selfless spirit of service with enthusiasm and patience. Because it is a test. Sometimes we want things to go the way we expect them to go. And if everything went the way you expected them to go, you wouldn't make much progress. When they don't go the way you want them to go, but you're still pursuing with enthusiasm and you have patience. That is the path of accessing divine grace. We may be chanting the holy names, we may be meditating, and we may be wondering why, I'm, why my mind still disturbed, why my mind still wanders here and there. Have any of you ever had that experience? Sometimes? <laughs> All the time? <laughs> or many times? And we're not tasting the nectar of the holy name. We're not tasting the nectar of God in our worship or our devotion or in our practices. But we carry on. We carry on with enthusiasm and we're patient because it's a great thing. It's the greatest thing to get this higher taste of God consciousness. It's like if you enroll in NYU or Columbia University and you're a f freshman, do they still call them freshmen? Yes, first year? because I've been over in India for a long time. <laughs> and you want a PhD. And you're really doing your studies very, very diligently. And you're thinking, well, why don't I have my PhD? You have to continue with enthusiasm, with determination, but you have to be patient. It may take eight years. <laughs> and you have to pursue but you're willing to work hard and be patient for eight years to get a PhD. And after you get your PhD in today's society, you may not even get a job. <laughs> <laughs> you, may go, you may be going door to door with leaflets for the, for the local restaurant or something. <laughs> or pumping gas at a gas station. I know one person couldn't get a job. He was, he was digging holes for fences, for digging holes for the posts and f fences. Yes, you have. And he said, I'm a PhD. 
said, it stands for post hole digger. <laughs> but Prabhupada is a Paramhamsa, so anyone who is serving him is PhD, Paramhamsa Das. <laughs> For love of God, for that param drishtvani vartate, that higher taste of the holy name, for that higher taste of, of, of really ex accessing and experiencing God's presence in our prayers, that's the highest achievement. If we don't feel it after a few months or a few years, and we start becoming discouraged, that means we're taking it very cheaply. We should be very enthusiastic. And just be grateful for the opportunity to try. It's just such a privilege to engage in any service of the Lord. It's such a privilege to chant God's names. It's such a privilege to pray for pure devotional service. It's such a privilege to serve others in the spirit. And we should recognize and be grateful. We should be anxious, lowly, with eagerness, but at the same time with patience. Because it's a very great thing. We should never get discouraged. So this was the example of yourself. And then Parasara told this man, he said, actually, Ananta could have told you all of these explanations himself. But he's so kind to me that he wanted me to meditate and contemplate and explain all these things to you so that I could become purified by explaining it. That is his kindness to me. Now do you understand? Thank you very much. Hari Rama Hari Rama Rama